Hi everyone. It's uh, six o'clock. And uh, Vincent, am I okay to kick off? I think we would rather wait for another two minutes, perhaps, because there are a okay. few people joining at the moment. Still coming in. Okay. So yeah. then we will kick off in three minutes, I think. How's that as compromise between two and five? <laughs> Okay. Um, so we'll give everybody a couple of minutes just to arrive in the session because uh, actually Angelica's right. There's um, the numbers are, and the attendance numbers are going up now at six o'clock. So if you've just joined us, we're just waiting for a couple of minutes to give people a chance to uh, to join in. If you want to, you can put a message in the chat telling us where you're beaming in from this evening. That's always fun to see. I'm in Norfolk on the east coast of the UK. Well, I'm looking forward to your presentation from Munich tonight. Uh, Roger, I think you might be the furthest <laughs> flung from New York. <laughs> So then, it's three minutes past six. Shall I kick us off then? Yeah, I think we're good to go. Okay. So then, um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening if you're in the UK like I am. Um, and welcome to the second session of Connext, uh, which is Modern Materials tonight. Uh, my name is Shane Rivers of West Dean College in the UK. And my name is Angelika Rauch of the University of Applied Sciences in Potsdam in Germany. And Angelica and I will be hosting tonight's session. Uh, so before we proceed with our introduction, there's just a few basic rules of conduct to whip through. Um, please make sure your microphone and your webcam are turned off so as not to disturb the presenters during their talk. Uh, we encourage you to ask questions and do put your questions in the chat box. We're going to pick some of those up for the Q&A and um, we'll ask those questions at the end of the session in the same order as the presentations. Um, to our presenters, for some unknown technical reasons, some of the slides show up zoomed in. Um, if you think that's happening, use the zoom function by clicking on the magnifying glasses in the bottom, sorry, magnifying glass in the upper left corner of the slides. Um, our sessions are going to be recorded for archival reasons and to keep the option open to share the, the contributions with a broader audience. Obviously, this will only happen when we receive the consent of our speakers. Um, and finally, this is a conference for and by emerging conservators. So please respect one another for the speakers' exceptional efforts of making this event happen. Um, you know, it's a, it's a big effort to do the presentations and particularly to do it if it's their first time. Uh, so please keep that first time presentation in mind. Um, and 
that's um, that's great. Thank you. So. Yeah, and uh, also welcome for me to this uh, second session of Connext. And uh, just for those who were not here last year when we had our kind of first round uh, or last Monday, here is just a short introduction of how Connext came into being or what we try to achieve. So Connext is um, a, a joint effort of the conservation training programs of the universities of Antwerp, Amsterdam, Hildesheim, Cologne, Potsdam, West Dean, Tomar, and Lincoln, all within the field of wood and furniture conservation. And some programs also incorporate uh, polychromy and modern materials, hence the, uh, the wide variety in subjects we encounter throughout the different Connect sessions. And our ambition really is to connect you, the students, with your international student colleagues and to give you the opportunity to share your work. And we think, of course, um, education is paramount for the future of our field. And uh, it starts with sharing, sharing your hard work, your experiences, your knowledge. And Connext tries to provide a platform for this exchange. We also, of course, hope that you will continue doing so in the rest of your studies and your professional life. And um, we just hope that uh, we manage to lower the threshold for you to send in your work for conferences like those of ICOM CC, Stichting uh, Ebenist, or Future Talks. So we hope that Connects can be a kickstart for your national and international career network. And international it is. In this session, we have 186 registered participants, and there are 214 overall for all Connect sessions um, registered. Um, they come from over 28 different educational and research institutes and from 16 different countries, and I think that's uh, great. It's much better than we've uh, ever expected. So now we think you are as excited as we are to kick off this second Connect session with the help of one of the many established keynote speakers who were so kind to share their knowledge in this event. So let's Connect. Thank you, Angelica. Yes, it's my honor to introduce today's keynote lecturer, Mr. Roger Griffiths. Uh, Roger is a subject, uh, subject, honestly. Roger is a sculptor and objects conservator. He's the owner of Two Sticks Incorporated, which is a New York based conservation studio specializing in modern and contemporary art conservation. Uh, the company was founded in 2005. Before that, he worked as a sculptor and objects conservator at the Museum of Modern Art for 24 years um, until he moved into the private sector full time. He and I were actually at the Royal College of Art at the same time. Uh, and Roger graduated from his MA with his MA in 1997. He's worked at various institutions, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Steidlich Museum in Amsterdam, and at the Sainsbury Centre for the Visual Arts in Norwich, um, which is part of the University of East Anglia. He's published and lectured internationally on a wide range of conservation issues. His recent research examines the nature of the collaborative process of art professionals in relation to the exhibition, installation, preservation, maintenance and storage of ephemeral contemporary art. So Roger, thank you very, very much for being with you, uh, being with us. The floor is yours. Thank you, Shane. Um, so I guess I have to figure out how to share this. This is a, a new platform for me, so bear with me. So if you open the chat panel on the right of your screen with the little arrows yes. in the bottom right hand corner, and then it's got a little, the, the middle one is a square with an arrow and that's your yeah, share. I've, I've gotten there. Let's see if I'm, 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 I think maybe I should, the first think, slide should be up. Yeah, it says Unite de Habitation. Yes, Kitchen. so I think we're ready to go. Yeah, good to go. Thank you. Um, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I know that everyone's coming in from uh, many, many uh, locales. Um, and um, I'd like to um, thanks Vincent and Sophie for inviting me here today and also for Shane and Angelica for introducing me uh, and moderating this session. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today and to present to you about a conservation project where I was the leading conservator. Um, and what I'll be presenting today is a project 
um, from the Museum of Modern Art. Um, I was there for over 24 years, as um, Shane had just mentioned. Um, and I worked very closely with the architecture and design uh, department at MoMA. And the story I'm about to unpack with you was a, um, a, a project that lasted nearly two years, which included all the research and the study visits and finally the conservation treatment of um, the uh, Le Corbusier's and Charlotte Perrion's kitchen, uh, which was part of the um, Unité de Habitation in uh, Marseille, France. Um, the original idea was to restore this for a major exhibition on Le Corbusier called Le Corbusier, um, an Atlas of Modern Languages. Uh, however, that didn't happen. It, it, it turned out that um, due to the fact that Charlotte Perrion was the main designer of this kitchen, it was decided to be removed from the exhibition and was later um, displayed in another exhibition, which I'll talk about later. Um, one of the reasons I chose this project, one was for its um, um, really collaborative effort. This really took a lot of people to sort of uh, come to fruition, but also just the many materials and the composites which were a part of this uh, object. Uh, I hope that you'll take away from this talk how building connections across um, our profession, which I think uh, Angelica mentioned, is really important. And to maintain those contexts, um, they're going to be really valuable for your career and for the future. So I don't see my slide is not up, so I'm wondering if there's a problem. Hmm. Vincent or Shane or somebody could. So it's moved on on our screen. OK, I have nothing. I see nothing on my screen. Huh. So okay, that it's... is really strange. OK, I don't need to see it. If I know that you guys are seeing it, maybe yep. that's OK. So we've got uh, to... Roger, just uh, let me know when to uh, move forward with the slides. I do that. OK, um, I would love to be able to see it, though. <laughs> um, let me see if I can. No, that's not working. Do you, OK, you... I will just pro progress. So um, uh, Le Corbusier was a Swiss French architect, designer, painter, urban planner, writer, and one of the pioneers of what is now regarded as modern architecture. Um, he was born in Switzerland and became a French citizen in 1930. His career spanned five decades, and he designed buildings in Europe, Japan, India, North, Amer North and South America. Here is a snapshot of some of his most famous architectural projects that have been named as UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Some of these buildings you may not recognize, but many of them you may. The church at Ronchamp, the government buildings of Chandigarh, India, the Museum of Western Art of Tokyo, Japan, and the most famous of his projects was the residence that began his career as a modern architect, the Villa Savoie seen in the center. Um, besides architecture, Le Corbusier and his atelier designed furniture. However, most of these works were actually designed by Charlotte Perrion while working in his atelier. Uh, you may recognize some of these pieces um, that, are, that are still in production today. As I mentioned, some of the early interiors and furniture uh, were designed in collaboration with the designer architect Charlotte Perrion. Miss Perrion was a French architect and joined the atelier in 1927. She continued to collaborate with him for the next two decades. After many years, uh, next slide. Can you go to the next slide? I'm not sure if it's on the next slide. Yes. Um, after after um, her years, at Le Corbusier Atelier, she continued to collaborate with other designers like Jean Prouvé, um, but uh, Charlotte Perrion went on to be one of the most famous female designer architects of the modern movement, working with other designers, uh, but also in her own right. Next slide. The Unité de Habitation in Marseille, or City Radius, will be the original setting of this project. For simplicity, I will refer to this project as simply Unité. Um, and the design of the Unité building in Marseille was commissioned um, 
to Le Corbusier by the French government shortly after the end of the World War II. It was a view in creating a model for a new generation of public housing complexes to be, to be built throughout France. To cope with the strict technical and financial constraints of the project, Le Corbusier designed a single large building that could accommodate up to 1,600 people. And this project, but this project was originally started right after the war and scheduled to be completed by 1948, but the project was delayed and wasn't completed until 1953. Next slide. This image is an image of the Unité as it, ex as it exists today, located in a suburb of Marseille. If you ever find yourself in Marseille, this is a must see. Next slide. Here's a closer and more detailed view of the outside of the building. And what I think is most surprising is the amount of color that you will see used um, not only on the exterior of the building, but also on the interiors as well. Um, Le Corbusier is well known for his use of color uh, and or architecture, polychromy, as he says. Next slide. In, in the 1920s, Le Corbusier published his own influential book titled Toward an Architecture, in which he famously wrote, a house is a machine for living. It reflected his functionalist vision for the future of domestic design. His design principles include the following five points, pillars, roof garden, open floor plan, long windows, and open facades. Basically, Le Corbusier called for a radical change in architecture of this time. Um, the Unité in Marseille fulfills all of these principles. Next slide. The Unité in Marseille was a project um, that he originally wanted to be pre, uh, prefabricated. Essentially, he wanted the apartments to be slotted into place like a bottle in a bottle rack. And this illustration uh, illustrates this principle. Next slide. This next illustration gives you an idea of this again, this sort of like prefab apartment that could be slotted in. And you will see that these were duplex apartments, so they were on two floors with double height ceilings, which would bring light into this open plan of the apartment. Next slide. The interior of the, um, of the apartments, or in this case, the living room, gives you an idea of how modern they were of the time and illustrates their open living plan. Next slide. Looking in the opposite direction from the living room, we'll see the dining room, the kitchen, and the stairs leading to the second floor where the two bedrooms and the bathroom was located. And just please take note sort of the colors that you see here in the kitchen since this is gonna be the main topic of my talk today. Next slide. I couldn't resist to show one more image of the kitchen, looking towards the kitchen. And again, please note um, the kitchen and its colors. This is a, an apartment, it's apartment number 50 in the Unité that belongs to um, uh, a Frenchman by the name of Jean-Marc Drut, which I'll talk a little bit more later in the talk. Next slide, please. Here is an isometric illustration that was shared with me from the Dinoya Salon and um, uh, where the, you see the kitchen. And I hope that this illustrates sort of the dimensions of the kitchen and how actually very small the kitchen actually was. And these apartments weren't huge apartments. And you have to remember these were, you know, apartments that were built um, after the war to house many refugees from so many uh, uh, refugees from the Second World War. So, but, you know, they were modern and they, uh, but yet, built by the government. Um, next slide, please. So as I mentioned, um, MoMA was going to purchase a kitchen uh, for an upcoming exhibition. And so eventually uh, we do, uh, in fact, purchase a kitchen. It was from a private owner in Munich, Germany. Next slide. And prior to that acquisition, um, the museum sent me to Munich to actually do a conservation assessment that um, the curators wanted to know if, uh, if this was a good example or not, and could it be restored. Um, here's the kitchen as I saw it in the private collector's mother's garage in Munich. It was assembled, which was kind of nice. Next slide. Um, another view so you can get a chance to sort of get an idea of what, you know, what I was seeing for the first time. Next slide. And finally, here is a view of the sink with the soap holes, the storage bins, the food for food and root vegetables, an ice box. I use the word ice box because it was designed as an ice box since refrigeration in 1940, 
1848 of post-war France was such that many people didn't have this in their own apartment. Next slide. And the overall condition of the work I, I finally determined was fair to poor. And you might really question where I'm coming up with this and why would we then go on to acquire something in this condition. But really through, uh, and, and I really couldn't, I wasn't quite sure what I was looking at and how it was very difficult for me to contextualize what I was looking at since it was so out of context. Um, but through collaboration and speaking to many uh, other owners of these kitchens and other institutions, um, I was able to sort of ascertain that actually this was in a decent condition. It had many of the elements that many of the other kitchens didn't have when they were purchased for their institutions. And therefore, I was encouraged that this was the one that we should choose and a good example that we could restore with time, collaboration, and of course, money. Next slide. As part of our research, I traveled to Munich, Germany, Marseille, France, Paris, to see the, these various versions of kitchens and other collections. Here is an example of the Centre Pompidou in Paris's uh, version um, after it had gone through a full conservation restoration. Please note the monochromatic cabinetry in this version. Next slide. Les Arts Decoratifs, uh, the museum in Paris, had another version. And as you can see, it was much more colorful than the example from the Centre Pompidou. However, the peach color that you see here didn't feel quite right to me, uh, even though I was just beginning my research. Next slide. And lastly, here is one in the collection of the Dinoya Samlong in Munich, Germany. Uh, this is an image that was taken right after it was acquired and shared with me by Tim Bechtold, who's actually here today. And he just informed me that this work will be installed. They've completed the restoration of their kitchen, and this will be installed for the first time in the next uh, month or so. Next slide. Just a few images of some of the immediate problems I saw uh, with the kitchen, the missing heating elements. The, of the burner plates of the stove, there was veneer losses, there was a missing light fixture, and apparent overpaint on many of the surfaces of the kitchen. Next slide. Um, this small hatch door that you see here was fully intact with all of its hardware. And at first, we were a little unclear what this was until we actually went to Marseille to see these, uh, these kitchens when they were in situ. Um, what we discovered that this was the door for the ice man to insert ice in the ice box from the hallway. Therefore, not actually having to enter into the apartment, no one could be there. And what was really fascinating about this project was discovering what Le Corbusier was trying to uh, create here. You know, a, a place where uh, a, a, a whole kind of unit or small city with shops um, a post office, and there was a school. So it really had just about everything in this building. Um, also on the right, you'll notice um, there's the uh, sink, which was this aluminum sink, but we were missing the faucet and the handles. Next slide, please. So to recap, you know, uh, some of the missing elements that we knew we had to source or remake were the the um, key or door pull, which acted as both as a key and a door pull. On the upper left, on the right side, you'll see that those uh, heat, electric heating plates of the stove were missing, um, the faucet for the sink, and finally, the um, light fixture. And all of these would either have to be sourced or facsimiles made for the, and fabricated for the project. Next slide. Probably the largest part of the project was to restore the kitchen and determine what was the original paint campaign, and, for, uh, and especially for this unit. Um, it was unclear how many of the versions of the color palette Le Corbusier used, and it was, um, but it was possible to determine that and determine those original schemes, not only through cross-section, but also through visual paint scrapes and research and comparative knowledge from one institution to the other. And I must give a shout out to uh, Dino Samlong and uh, Tim Bechtold and his, co his colleague Julia because they were incredibly generous with me, providing with information about what they had discovered. And uh, there is a paper that they wrote about this kitchen as well that is published. Next slide. Um, I was um, already aware of all the research that had already been done and completed and published, uh, particularly the use of color in uh, Le, Corbusier, Le Corbusier's buildings and interiors. And one of those uh, uh, 
scholars was a man by the name of Arthur Rugg. Um, Arthur Rugg was a professor in Zurich, um, has published a book uh, titled Le Corbusier Polychromie Architecturale. Um, this is a copy of that book or the cover. Um, and we were very fortunate that we were able to bring um, Arthur Rook over to New York during the process of the restoration of this kitchen and to consult with him to, to really confirm were we actually seeing the right and determining the right campaign or the palette for our kitchen. Um, and gladly he did and really was a, a tremendous uh, uh, success for us. Um, next slide. So um, one of the things that I was able to do was, um, so here you're going to see a couple images of paint uh, where, before we started the restoration. And these are, again, some images that Tim Bechtold shared with me early on uh, during his uh, restoration. But I have these images mainly because I was trying to convince the curators and the museum to purchase the kitchen. So I was showing them what were some of the issues with these kitchens with overpaint? You know, these kitch kitchens and bathrooms are things that you, of course, all know are, are things to get restored over and over in homes. And there's no, this is true for the Unite as well. Um, we weren't exactly sure when our kitchen was dismantled since we did buy it from a private collector who had bought it from a, a dealer. Uh, and we weren't even clear if this was actually from one kitchen or not. Um, we found out that what the dealer would do is he would collect um, parts of kitchens when people would do renovations out of skips or dumpsters um, and then cobble them together. And when he had a full kitchen together, he would sell them. So we know that our kitchen wasn't from one apartment. That was probably from multiple apartments. Next slide. Um, through historical research at the Le Corbusier Foundation, um, I was able to go to Paris and spend two days working with an archivist there, uh, where I was able to find many letters and correspondence receipts uh, directly related to the kitchen. Um, the palette um, that we discovered and also uh, what was also confirmed with uh, Dinoya Samlong was that these were burger material paints. Um, the palette for the kitchens were basically uh, white, green, and red ochre were the primary colors. Um, the uh, varnish was used, a dark gray for baseboards and kick plates. The cabinet interiors and the exterior frames were white. The drawer fronts and the door handles were varnished. And the cabinet fronts above the sink were either varnished with a red ochre, and the cabinet fronts in front of uh, over the stove were a varnish or a green paint. Next slide. We were quite aware of the Le Corbusier paints were being produced by the Swiss paint manufacturer KT Color, and they, and they were very happy to collaborate with us to donate any paint we needed for the restoration. Next slide. Therefore, we were able to narrow down the color campaign they mat that matched with their colors, uh, the Le Corbusier KT colors that were being produced, so we could therefore source them for our restoration. And so here's the paint colors that were used in the kitchens. Next slide. Next, we went on to do cross sections of our different aspects of our uh, kitchen. Um, we wanted to determine particularly those cabinet fronts that we knew were either supposed to be green, red, okra, or varnished. Um, this was one of the um, cabinets that was above the, the uh, sink. Uh, it was painted white, and to our sort of surprise, but also uh, Happy to see that this was white from its beginning. It had somewhere around seven layers of paint. Not unusual for kitchens to be repainted that often since this was a 60 or 70 year old object. Next slide. The cross section on one of the uh, sliding doors on the bar cuisine, this was the small unit that divided the kitchen from the dining room. Um, we kind of knew that this was probably an original paint layer because it was so thinly painted. Um, the cross section just basically confirmed our suspicion that the red ochre was actually the original color of that um, door front. Next slide. But the one that we really were most uh, concerned about was the one over the stove. And that was all, both of them were painted uh, white. 
uh, but the one on the left should be should be green. We we realized through the research. Um, we did uh, we did the cross section, and luckily we were able to find very minor remnants of green um, through this cross section, and gave us confidence that we needed to remove the overpaint that was on the door front and try to reveal that original green paint. Next slide. Um, again, the Denoya Semlong were very generous in providing me with these illustrations during my early part of my research. And you can see here the, the part of the kitchen that we purchased is on the upper right. Um, and the, on the left are two illustrations that kind of give you what are documented views of what the campaign should be on the kitchen door fronts. Um, we're getting very close, as you can see, it almost compares. Um, if you'll go to the next slide, please. Here's a few more illustrations. And finally, um, the illustration in the lower left corner was almost exactly what was confirming what we had. Um, the only difference was since there were left and right kitchens, because the apartments were a left side and a right side. Um, so this is a mirror image of our kitchen where we have the green door on the upper left instead of the upper right. Next slide. So back to the sort of part of our kitchen. This is, this is an image that was taken still in the private um, uh, collection when it was in the garage. But I just wanted to remind you, this is where we began. This is where this, the, the project began. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the last illustrations I'm going to show you is an illustration over the sink, which I mentioned earlier. Over the sink, it should be green and varnished. So this is just showing you again. Our uh, image on the right shows our um, uh, kitchen and the illustrations on the left sort of illustrating that the green should be there. Next slide, please. So we proposed a sort of very brief sort of outline to present to the um, to the curators of, you know, what was going to be needed. Um, so we this is just a very short list of, you know, historical and comparative research. And what I mean by that, that was to do uh, research in the foundation, as I mentioned, and to do uh, comparative research with other institutions and do visits to those institutions to see those collections, uh, those units that are in those collections. Um, scientific analysis, which we did with media ID paint, we did cross section, um, and then the conservation and restoration, which was the, the sort of big sort of lift uh, to remove overpaints, to restore um, veneers, to uh, go in and make um, facsimiles or source and find elements that were missing in our um, kitchen. And lastly, the installation, de-installation plans and drawings for the, for the object. Next slide. I just wanted to give you one more quick overview. This is how, where we began. So this is the kitchen. Once it arrived, it was purchased. It arrived to the conservation lab. And this is the first time we've set it up in the lab just to get it a snapshot of what we needed to do. And so that's what this image is, is, is doing for you today, is to say, well, this is where we began. Next slide. Unfortunately, you know, today I don't really have the time to share with you all the images of every detail of the final treatment. Um, the removal of all the overpaint, the repairs of the veneers, the rebuilding of missing elements, or the making of false walls and ceilings, which would truly capture the kitchen and how it would be seen in its if it were in situ. But I hope the next few images will give you a little bit of a snapshot of, of, of what we had to do and what, was, what we did do for this object. Next slide. Um, most of the overpaint um, on the doors and uh, some of the sections uh, we did discover was an acrylic paint. This was um, uh, through our analysis and FTR analysis. Uh, we know that was true. We knew that then that this could be removed uh, using heat and a scalpel. So it might have been an arduous task, but we, you know, once you get into it, it actually goes quite quickly. This is my colleague, Ann Grady, who was working with me at the time, working on the kitchen. Um, and we were able to then remove the overpaint on many of the door fronts. Now, we didn't remove paint from many of the sort of um, base of the base cabinetry. The, we felt that that since we know from historical records it was white and it was still white, we tried to live with part of the history of that object and to keep that paint there. So we were mainly trying to just create something that looked like it was better cared for and would match the paint campaign that we knew should be there. Next slide. 
Here's an image of the bar cuisine, um, which is the one aspect of the kitchen that was prefabricated. As I mentioned earlier, all the, the entire apartment was supposed to be prefabricated, but due to cost and time and everything that didn't happen. And the only part of the kitchen that was prefabricated was this section. And this was a section that Charlotte Perrion had designed in the original design and it was the one part that didn't change. Uh, after, uh, unfortunately, Charlotte Perrion didn't get to stay with the, uh, the Le Corbusier Atelier through the completion of the building. She left at some point. Um, they did keep many of her designs, um, but there were some alterations and changes due to the prefabrication was not how the kitchen was built. Um, you will see in the lower left, we're removing a gray overpaint. And also on the upper right corner, that door front has a paint scrape where we know that in, that was not supposed to be painted white, that that was supposed to be varnished. And we found the varnish underneath. Next slide. As I mentioned, part of the treatment was to, to travel and to visit uh, various places and locations. Um, we did have the opportunity to travel to Marseille to see the building, to see the apartments. Um, the librarian and archivist uh, that was there at the time was incredibly generous. And she was able to arrange that we get to see five different apartments in the building, including one was apartment number 50, number 50 which I mentioned earlier, which was the apartment by Jean-Marc Drut and his partner. Um, they had painstakingly restored the apartment. Um, all of its original colors, all of its original uh, things were intact, all the fixtures. Uh, and was considered the most complete and original condition of an apartment in the entire building. Um, he allowed us to take pictures and photographs and uh, measurements so that we could replicate things from that were missing in our kitchen. And we ended up becoming quite good friends through that process. Next slide. Um, we also noticed that um, the sink had this, what appeared to be quite new, fixture. And so I questioned Jean-Marc. I said, you know, what, well, what, what are we looking here? Is this where you just found this fixture? And he said, no, actually, um, when, I, when we bought the apartment, we wrote to every single apartment uh, owner in the building and as well as the superintendent to basically ask if anybody was planning to renovate their kitchen and, 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 and throw away anything to please contact them because they were trying to uh, restore their apartment and their kitchen. And they were looking specifically for the original faucet and handles. Um, just by chance, the superintendent happened to find in a deep storage in the building uh, a box with the original 1950s uh, fixtures. And so they were able to acquire that. And so they're the only apartment in the entire complex that has the original uh, faucet and handles in the, in the apartment. Next slide. So I spoke to Jean-Marc and he was very generous. He, he allowed me to make a mold. So we were able to hire uh, Carolina Hall, a conservator from France, to go to his apartment to make a mold of his uh, faucet and the handles and then cast it in a polyester. So what you're seeing here is the polyester cast that she sent to me, um, which is an exact replica of the original that's in Jean-Marc's uh, apartment. Um, we then, next slide, we then had it chrome plated so that it would give the appearance of metal uh, and we're able to then install it as you see in the lower slide uh, that really gives a believable view that this is uh, a, a real uh, faucet and uh, handles, but in fact, it's just a poly, uh, a, an epoxy uh, chrome plated facsimile. Next slide. So one of the things that really came about through the relationship with Jean-Marc Drut, which you know, I really, really uh, stress, and I think that Angelica mentioned this in, 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 in the introduction, was this idea of collaboration and this idea of, of making sure you keep those uh, collaborations. And Jean-Marc was incredibly, um, uh, really uh, generous with us by allowing us to make the, the, the mold for the faucet. He also had an extra key pole for the, for the, the, the locked doors. So we were able to purchase that from him and then make a copy for the second one we needed. And lastly, the, the, the actual uh, stove that were missing these heated plates, um, we were able to make facsimiles from his original 
uh, for our kitchen as well. And we just found a fabricator in New York to help us uh, realize that. Next slide, please. So the kitchen is getting uh, uh, close to completion. Uh, we then were able to collaborate with our exhibition and design production team at MoMA. They were the, the, the people that kind of help us build out the walls for exhibitions. But in this case, we were able to use them for this object. And they came up with really good, truly amazing solutions to create these false walls that would hold the cabinetry and hold the whole thing together, which would then pull the thing together to read as one complete object. Next slide. Just to remind you where, 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 we, where, we, um, where we began, this was the image I showed you earlier uh, of before treatment. Next slide, please. And here is an image where uh, we're near completion. All the false walls are now in place and constructed. Um, all the cabinet fronts have been um, paint removal has completed, all the sort of veneers have been repaired, replacements parts have been sourced or, or facsimiles made, and the, the only thing missing are the detail of the colored walls and the ceiling is not there. Next, next slide. So this is just a, 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 a quick um, detail that our uh, photo department took for the catalog image. Um, this was in our conservation studio, so it's not really completely finished, but it was a way to, for, for them to get a view so they could have an image for the catalog. And this happens a lot in museums where, you know, the catalog deadline images are much earlier than, and we're still working on it. So we were able to at least kind of pull it together for them to get these images. Next slide, please. One more image, sort of a stage with some pots and things. Um, this is the, you can see now the, the sliding Cabinet door is green. We were able to remove all that overpaint and reveal the uh, original green. It wasn't in the most perfect condition, but we decided to leave it that way because it was really true to the history of the object. It was over the stove. Heat probably heated up the paint and caused it to get damaged. And we thought that you know that was being kind of really uh, real to uh, and true to the object's history. Next slide, please. And finally, we have the, the kitchen uh, fully completed, installed in our galleries. Um, this, as I mentioned earlier, was not installed in the Le Corbusier exhibition, um, but instead, because the work was really primarily designed by Charlotte Perrion, they decided that it made sense to put it in another exhibition that was one year later. And uh, so this is the shot of the work installed for the first time in the exhibition titled Designing Modern Women, 1890 to 1990, an exhibition that was curated by Juliet Kenshin. Next slide. And this is my last slide. And if, if people want to read a little bit more about um, this kitchen, about what we did, we did create blogs during the, the full year of the restoration. Um, and so there are the, here are the five blogs that you can read. There's some really detailed information, a little bit more information that I was able to unpack today. But um, I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope um, you guys have a great symposium. Thank you. Roger, thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, very inspiring talk. It was great. And uh, it clearly showed the complexity of um, the research you carried out and the treatment. And uh, these kitchens always leave me wondering how it was working in the kitchen, in those kitchens. And um, yeah, any, any questions for Roger, you can put in the chat for uh, the Q&A session that we'll have after the next two talks. Um, I would like to quickly proceed to our first paper presentation of today. And uh, we are very proud to announce Astrid Behling, who got her bachelor degree in Potsdam and now is a master graduate of the CICS at the University of Cologne. And her talk is about solvent-free epoxy resins for the consolidation of heavily degraded wood, which I think is a truly important topic for many conservators. So Astrid, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Am I speaking loud? Yes. Perfect. Yes. <laughs> Hello, fine. everyone. 
Yeah, okay, great. Hello, everyone, and welcome to my presentation. I'd like, first of all, to thank the organizers of this meeting and, of course, for inviting me here today. And let me start by just saying a few words about my own background. I wrote my master thesis in 2020 at the Cologne Institute of Conservation Sciences in cooperation with the Institute of Wood Technology Dresden and the Technical University Dresden. And moreover, uh, the epoxy resin manufacturer Ipox Chemicals supported me by supplying materials and advice. And as you can see on the screen, our topic today is solvent-free epoxy resins. And I think uh, today's topic is of particular interest for those of you who are looking for an alternative for polyacrylates in solution and want to learn a little bit more about the opportunities of solvent-free epoxy resin system. And one brief comment on the term epoxy resin, it's applied to both the pre-polymer and the cured resin. Okay, epoxy resins as consolidant for degraded wood have been in use since the 1950s and epoxy resins are more rarely used than polyacrylates in solution and less research is carried out and the research was able to indicate that epoxy resins can increase the mechanical properties of the consolidated wood significantly better than polyacrylates like acryloid B72 and that's one important criterion. Unfortunately, there are still many prejudices against epoxy resins, and this is probably because previous studies selected repeatedly the say high viscose and reactive products, and they were diluted with large quantities of solvents to reduce the viscosity and the reactivity. But that brought disadvantages like high level of resin shrinkage upon cure, or disruption of the curing process. But I think this can be avoided because today there's a wide range of potential solvent-free can uh, candidates regarding rheology, chemical and mechanical properties. And however, only a few studies and field trays have considered the use of solvent-free systems. One of those exception is a diploma thesis written at Kix. But the epoxy resins had not been adequately tested in degraded wood, and that is where my thesis kicked in. In order to validate the suitability of a consolidant criteria on the idle product are needed, and this slide should give you an overview of a few general requirements. Most important, the consolidant should improve the physical mechanical characteristics of the impregnated wood and it should sufficiently penetrate and distribute in the deteriorated wood through low viscosity and small particle size. And ideally, the consolidant should be non-toxic or at most just slightly toxic for us. Furthermore, it should be reliable cure at room temperature and should have a low reaction temperature in order not to jeopardize the object. Also, the hybriscopic behavior, for example, for example, the swelling and shrinkage behavior should not be changed in order to prevent cracking or the detachment of consolidated areas. To sum it up, the idle consolidant should idly recover the original properties of the degraded wood, but unfortunately, nobody has invented that product yet. So besides that, the priority of various requirements on the consolidant will vary from one application to the other. In my further presentation, I will focus on four major topics. First of all, I will introduce you to the composed and tested candidate epoxy resin systems. And secondly, on the basis of test series on different conservation relevant criteria, I will identify the most appropriate epoxy resins. And thirdly, I will present you the selected results of the in-depth investigation of the selected epoxy resin. And finally, I will close with an evaluation. On this slide, you can see the composed candidate epoxy resin systems. And for this, I did literature review. I looked at field research project and I entered into discussion with IPOX chemicals. And 
The shown epoxy resin system consists of three parts. The first part is the epoxy resins or the pre-polymer and the epoxy resin got diluted with so-called reactive diluents and they have a viscosity reducing effect and some of them reduce the functionality of the reaction system too. And in contrast to solvents, the reactive diluents don't evaporate. They become chemically bound into the cross-linked network of the cured resins. And the percentage of the epoxy resin and the reactive diluent varies within the system, as you can see in the table, and the epoxy resin systems are cured with different types of amine curing agents. And now let me go to the second point, which is identifying the most appropriate epoxy resins on the basis of a test series. Uh, the test series, of course, shouldn't be carried out on actual objects. And because of this, I use test specimens with a typical pattern of damage. Scott's pine sapwood severely degraded by a wood worm. And while selecting test samples for the test trail, I paid special attention to similar wood anatomical characteristics and wood density within a test group because you don't want to compare uh, apples and oranges. And overall, the procurement and of sufficiently homogeneously damaged Scott's spine was really a challenge which restricted the number of test specimens. Uh, to design a test series to evaluate the suitability of the individual epoxy raisins, the requirement of the idle consolidant were employed and experiments on the epoxy raisins are highlighted in blue in the table and the gray background indicates the testing on consolidated wood. And as the table shows, it was a successive and interrelated test series. Firstly, I defined a cutoff threshold for each criterion. And secondly, I used the principle of exclusion if an epoxy raisins didn't fulfill one or more defined requirements, I excluded it. To take the result ahead, uh, on this slide you can see the epoxy raisins which best met the requirements. And it's free of volatile organic compounds and it consists of standard epoxy raisins out of diaglycidyl ether of bisphenol A and F. And it is diluted by as much as almost 50% with two different kinds of reactive diluents. And this mixture got hardened by a curing agent out of polyoxypropylene diamine. And let us now have a closer look at the test results in detail. The selected epoxy raisin has a low viscosity of 75 millipascal seconds, so it's comparable with oil of oil. And as the figure in the middle shows, at room temperature, the cured epoxy resin is trans transparent. And the epoxy film, bended by hand, is firm but flexible and non-sticking. It has a glass transition temperature of about 39 degrees Celsius, which is in the desired range. The left figure shows how the impregnation behavior was tested. One cross section of the six centimeter long degraded test specimen were put in freshly mixed epoxy raisins and the selected epoxy raisin achieved complete impregnation. And the heat developed upon curing is about one degree Celsius about room temperature, so pretty low. And finally, the selected epoxy raisins showed the highest increase in compressive strength parallel to the grain of the three epoxy raisins considered for the final test. And now let's look at the list of carried out in-depth investigation of the selected epoxy raisin. The selected epoxy raisin got analyzed for its time-dependent flow behavior and its curing shrinkage. And furthermore, I examined by microscopic examination how the raisin distribute in the wood matrix. And I carried out pressure strength test and three-point load test to determine the bending strength and the modulus of elasticity. And lastly, I assessed the swelling behavior. And given the short amount of time, I can only present some of the results which are underlined. 
Um, the left figure shows the preparation of the wood specimens for the in-depth investigation. And as I've already explained, they were fully impregnated with epoxy raisins by placing one cross section in the liquid epoxy raisins until it was fully impregnated. And then they were removed and the remaining raisin was wiped off. And after the impregnation process, the test specimen conditioned to the defined test climate for over seven weeks. And as the right figure indicates, compared to the non-degraded wood, let's call them native wood, uh, the degraded wood had a density or weight loss of almost 65%. And through the impregnation, the raisin, or, so, uh, through the impregnation with the raisin, the wood density reached and even succeeded the density or the weight of the Scots pine. And let's now move on to the results of the compression test parallel to the grain. And I wanted to figure out how the compression strength in the degraded wood increases through the consolidation. Or to put it another way, how much compressive load can the wood or the test specimen withstand until it breaks? And therefore, I tested multiple in multiple execution the three, three types of wood specimens and shown on the previous slide. You can see the test results on the box plot, and my reference value is the native wood on the left side of the plot. As uh, sorry, um, as you can see in the middle of the box plot, the degradation caused a drastic reduction of the compressive strength. The value is just under 20% of the native Scots pine. And fortunately, the impregnation significantly increases the compressive strength of the degraded wood by almost 80%, but is still less than one third of the Scots pine. And finally, I would like to discuss the results of the investigation of differential swelling behavior in tangential directions. And what I mean by differential swelling is the swelling percentage of the wood per one percent point change in wood moisture between 35 and 85 percent relative humidity. And the box plot shows that the native and the degraded wood specimens appears to behave almost the same. But if you look in the center of the box plot, you will notice the degraded consolidated wood has an elevated level of differential swelling. That means, means the swelling is a bit higher. And the reason for this may be that the epoxy raisin is hygroscopic because of its chemical properties. But it also demonstrates that the epoxy raisin stayed elastic after curing and allowing swelling and shrinkage movements of the consolidated wood. And now I will move on to the last point, the evaluation of the selected epoxy raisin. The selected epoxy raisin is low in viscosity and has a reliable slow cure rate with low and object harmless reaction temperature at ambient temperature. And it has a good processability and a sufficient penetration distribution in the investigated pattern of damage. So no solvents for lowering the viscosity are needed. And the epoxy raisin's formulation is free of volatile organic compounds and no solvents are evaporating on the curing process. And this means 100% of the consolidant remains in the degraded wood, which is why repeated consolidation treatments, as it is often the case with soluble thermoplastic raisins, are not necessary. And the selected epoxy raisin significantly improve the physical mechanical properties of the consolidated wood without becoming too firm and inflexible. However, it should be noted that the relative mechanical strength increases less than the weight. In addition, the hygroscopicity of the consolidated wood is elevated, causing a slightly greater swelling. And therefore, I strongly recommend for the practical application partial instead of complete impregnation and no more than absolutely necessary quantity of consolidant should be introduced. And finally, I'd like to highlight the open issues and possibility for further research. I think investigation on the topic of aging behavior is really necessary. Moreover, other patterns, damage and different level of degradation should be investigated. 
And here is a slide which summarizes the relevant literature. And here is the list of standards. And finally, I would like to thank everyone without whom this work would not have been possible. I wish you an exciting evening and I'm looking forward to your question and contribution. And thank you for listening. Uh, thank you, Astrid. That was a really interesting presentation and I'm sure that there will be questions afterwards. Um, now I have the honour to introduce Valmut Kreb from the University of Amsterdam. Valmut will tell us about the cellophane, uh, cellophane rush seat of a superleggera side chair. Uh, it's out technological examination and conservation. Valmut, here you go. Good evening, everybody, and thank you, uh, Mrs. Rivers, for the introduction. I'm honored. Um, to tonight, I would like to introduce to you uh, to the phenomenon of uh, cellophane chair seats. I came across this material in my research and conservation treatment of a superleggera side chair uh, designed by Gio Ponti. My research was a three-month project of my last year of wooden furniture conservation at the University of Amsterdam. Um, cellophane chair seats stand in the tradition of natural rush and of paper rush seats. The cellophane rush material has only been made for a few decades in the 20th century. So the seats that were made back then are now of a respectable age. And the treatment of an aged rush seat is still very often to remove the original material and entirely renew the seat. As a result, fewer and fewer cellophane seats survive and only very little has been written about them. And to my surprise, also very little has been written about cellophane uh, and cellophane conservation. So it was time for looking closer at the cellophane rush seat before all evidence would disappear. At first, I will tell you about the object that was the cause of my research, the superleggera side chair. I will tell you a little bit about its design and the choice of seat materials. Then I will zoom in on the cellophane rush seats themselves. First their background, then to material aspects. Finally, I will discuss the conservation problems and the treatment. I will end with a few takeaway points that might be useful for you yourself if you come across an unknown material. The superleggera is one of the style icons of the 20th century. It was designed in 1955 by Italian architect and designer Gio Ponti. And up to this day, it is manufactured by Italian furniture factory um, Cassina. The design of the chair is largely influenced by the Italian Chiavari chairs that were designed in early 19th century and were very popular for their lightness and elegance. Here you see two examples of them on the left. Ponti designed several versions of his own striving for lightness and for the archetypical shape of a chair while using modern as well as traditional materials. And he has also used a certain playfulness. In, 1960, uh, in 1951, he designed a successful Leggera, and in 1955, together with the furniture makers of Cassina, the Supera, the super lightweight, also known as model 699. The frame of the superleggera itself is uh, actually quite interesting, but I can only say here that all visible wood is ash wood, this part, and all the seat rails are of beech wood. The chairs were finished with cellulose, cellulose nitrate, uh, either transparent or in various colors. There was a choice for four different seat materials, one more traditional than the other, also in different colors. The cellophane version was supposedly also made in bright colors, such as yellow, green and blue. But unfortunately, I could not find any surviving examples of this. And also uh, only this uh, single black and white picture, which is quite enigmatic. Um, cellophane was not chosen for its lightness, as it's actually very heavy in comparison to the other uh, materials. So it might have been selected for its aesthetics and uh, for its modern look. The matted seats were not made in the Cassina factory, 
but the matting was executed as piecework by female matters in their own homes in the Kiavari region. The cellophane matting was discontinued by Cassina somewhere before 1979. Now I will zoom in on the cellophane rush seat itself uh, and the tradition that it's in. The natural rush seat is around since uh, ancient. Um, oh, can you see my pointer? Now you can see my pointer. The natural rush seat is already around since ancient Egypt. It's made from the leaves or stems of various plant materials, such as cattail or bulrushes. These leaves are twisted into coils by the matter himself, each time inserting new leaves. Early 20th century paper rush was developed, which consists of strips um, of paper twisted into a coil. The huge advantage of this is that the material can be um, pre-produced by machines and into an almost infinite coil so that the matting becomes faster and much easier. About the origin or the production of the cellophane rush, I wasn't able to find much. A US patent I found suggests that color cellophane rush might already have existed in the 1930s. But the chairs that I've looked for and found um, that have a cellophane rush are only the Leggera and the Super Leggera of Gio Ponti, and in one case also a Chiavari chair. So what is cellophane actually? Um, cellophane is a transparent film material that has mostly been used as a food, flower or cigarette packaging material. It's increasingly used again because it's biodegradable. Cellophane is namely not a plastic. It has been patented in 1912. To make cellophane, cellulose from plant material such as cotton is dissolved to make it viscous. It's then extruded through a split dye into an acidic bath where it's converted into cellulose now in the shape of a film. Then it can be bleached or plasticized. So cellophane is actually cellulose regenerated and it has characteristics similar to paper. It's hygroscopic and very, uh, very moisture sensitive but unsensitive to most other solvents. It's prone to photooxidation, so sensitive to light. Upon aging it yellows, it loses plasticizer and moisture, it shrinks and becomes brittle. Here you can see a package wrapped in two layers of cellophane that has been in the light for a few decades. The outer layer has yellowed and is falling apart. The moisture sensitiveness of cellophane can be a problem that is often overcome by applying a coating, for instance of cellulose nitrate. And indeed, on our object, FTIR, FTIR analysis showed that the cellophane of the superleggera has been coated by a layer of cellulose nitrate. The analysis was carried out by Suzanne de Groot of the Cultural Heritage Agency of the Netherlands. It's not known exactly how the cellophane rush was made, but it's likely that it's made in the same way as paper rush is made. Paper rush is made by using two or three strips of paper, guiding them carefully um, into a funnel to merge them together before they are twisted and further compressed into a coil and wound upon a spool. Using more strips of material instead of just one actually results in a more regular and denser coil. Paper spinning machines have been around since very early 20th, 20th century. Here you see the modern one. The cellophane coil of the Superleggera was also very densely packed, as you can see here in the section, and consisted of five strips of material. For my treatment and for making a mock-up, I have tried to replicate the coil and use the jig where I could guide and merge the strips, but uh, that was quite hard and you see that the result is still considerably coarser than the original here against the uh, underside of the seat that was in treatment. The coil that I made, I was only able to produce 100 meters and then my wrist started to protest. Um, uh, I used it to make a reconstruction of the seat pattern. The damage of the original seat actually provided good insight into how it was built up. This is made using the same techniques and build up as traditional net rush or paper rush seats with some adaptations to deal with the specific frame of the superleggera and with variations to influence its appearance and seat comfort. 
Here you can get an impression of how the original seed might have looked like when it was new. It's very bright, white and shiny. A large difference with the more natural look, actually, of the aged and sold cellophane, uh, soiled cellophane. Now over to the actual treatment um, and the object and its damage. Here you see the state that uh, uh, the seed was in. The upper side is much yellowed and soiled by small deposits of dirt into the crevices of the coils. From up close you can see that the coils that cross the seed rails are severely abraded, mostly sometimes into more layers of material. Any coils have broken at this location and a considerable amount of smaller or larger lengths of coils have been lost. You can see here all the lacunae. The coils on the upper side are rigid and brittle and the underside is a little bit more flexible. And pay attention to these um, ends here as they prove to be uh, prove to have a lot of spring back which proved difficult in treatment. Um, to get up. It was determined together with the owner that it was not feasible to develop a treatment method that would allow for further use of the chair, also, as so many coils had already been damaged to such a degree. So it was decided to, uh, to only treat the object to enhance its visual appearance and to protect broken freight ends against further damage. So broken strands would be re-adhered and missing strands would be substituted with new material. Several materials were selected to be tested as substitute materials, such as several transparent films, Japanese paper and gold beta skin. It turned out that materials actually all behave very differently if you try to twist them into a coil, and that only cellophane itself matched the appearance and material characteristics of the original. Here you see the bunch of um, tested materials, original piece of coil at the far left. To give the cellophane an aged appearance, the new cellophane, um, I used strips of new cellophane and um, one strip of Japanese tissue paper. Um, I rolled it into a coil and then saturated the coil with Paraloid B72. And then the strand could be soiled with pigment or with dirt as far as was needed for the location that it was to be on. A little bit about the selection of adhesives. Uh, cellophane is only sensitive to water and cellulose rate is sensitive to polar solvents, so adhesives in non-polar solvents could be considered. But tests on the mock-up, however, revealed that adhesives with a low viscosity penetrated the coils deeply and irreversibly and made them look saturated. In addition, clamping the coils on the weave proved difficult. So these adhesives, uh, so adhesives were tested that could be applied using heat. And BIFA 371 proved the strongest. And a strong adhesive was needed to overcome the very strong spring back of strands that were rounding the seat rails. BIFA 371 is also flexible, so would hopefully accommodate for expansion uh, and shrinkage of original material, and it proved fairly reversible. Another huge advantage of the heat applied adhesive was its direct tack, as clamping was difficult. For attachment methods, several methods were excessively tested on an aged mock-up. Some of these methods involved adhesives, but also methods were tested that could be used without adhesive. But these methods proved not strong enough. The method which applied a, a transparent bandage around the break, which you can see or not can see here, um, proved best for breaks in the center of the weave. It was visually pleasing and provided good alignment. For brakes located near the seat rail, only direct attachment on the seat rail with an adhesive proved strong enough to overcome the spring back. The actual treatment. Uh, for replicating missing strands, the combination of cellophane, Japanese paper and Paraloid B72 was used that was already mentioned. Original material with the most spring back such as here and here, was glued onto the wood of the seat rail with a mini glue gun filled with Biva 371. Strands were attached onto each other using a bandage of new cellophane 
that was primed with B5371 foil, and this was glued around both ends of broken coil using a hot spatula. After treatment, the object looked like this. Mens can be recognized from up close by a slightly thicker coil and the absence of wear. From a normal viewing distance, the battered appearance of the seat has been restored to a more clean and pleasing appearance, respectful of its age. The occluding. Uh, the research that was originally, in, originally intended for finding a good conservation treatment indirectly also led to a little bit more knowledge on the cellophane seats itself, but actually also to much more questions. The treatment was successful in enhancing the appearance of the object and making it safer to handle. But unfortunately, I wasn't able to devise a method to rescue all cellophane seats from deterioration if they are still to be used as a seat. I will conclude my talk with some takeaway points on the subject of dealing with an unknown material. Uh, at first, I would like to advise that you talk about the issue with many other conservators not only from your own field, but also of other disciplines, as they use literature, methods, materials, and adhesives that you would not think of yourself or have different ethical considerations. Also, don't focus on literature, as conservation literature on cellophane was very limited and sometimes proved to contradict itself. And finally, do a lot of testing. Test more materials and methods than you might think you need because sometimes a method or material surprises you in a positive or in a negative way and test several times as the outcome is largely dependent on your own experience and skill with a method. Sometimes you just need to practice. So that was it about the cellophane seats. I'd like to thank these experts for assisting me in this research and I'd like to thank you all very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Velmut, for an excellent and really interesting presentation and for some great takeaways. Um, we have a 15 minute Q&A session next and there's lots of questions in the chat box. So let's start with our uh, keynote speaker, Roger. Roger, could you unmute your microphone, please? Hello, Roger. Are you there? <laughs> <laughs> You did say you were going to stick around. Hello, Roger. You already answered uh, one of the questions in the chat, but we can have you hear, Can more. you hear me? Yeah. Can you yeah. hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Uh, Roger, um, uh, I, I've seen you've already answered a question in the chat, but uh, there are two more. Shane asks, uh, given that uh, your kitchen was made of many different kitchens, uh, no, given that your kitchen was made of many different kitchens, how did you decide the final approach to your paint scheme? Um, well, as I mentioned in the question that I answered, you know, we initially had to sort of come to sort of grips with the fact that there were all these different paint, paint campaigns or redecorations. Um, but ironically, most of the white paint matched pretty consistently. Now, I don't know if we just got lucky or if that's, mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe the maintenance in the building was helping people to do redecorations. Um, you know, we, we, we weren't really fully sure how many kitchens it was cobbled together from, but we think like possibly like the, the, the cabinet above the sink and the cabinet above the, the stove maybe came from different kitchens. Um, we did do some, you know, touch up paint. We tried to match it as best as possible where there were losses. But as I mentioned, we wanted to keep that history of the object. We didn't want to wipe away all that history. And it was a compromise we had to make with um, the curatorial team. The curatorial team was really sort of not convinced that was the way to go originally because they felt it was going to look too beat up and tattered. But we were able to pull it together and make it look much more homogeneous in the end. I don't know if that answered your question, but. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, uh, the second question we have here uh, is with regard to the hardware. Um, Vincent also might have missed it, but how did you clean the hardware like the sink and the stove? From the final result, these surfaces appear to be polished. 
Uh, we didn't do any polishing. Um, we think that some of that was done prior to the acquisition. What we think that happened was the dealer who sold the work originally to the private collector in Munich um, did a little bit of treatment on these as a way and a means to sort of sell them. Um, so we actually didn't do much cleaning. Uh, we did do some steam cleaning around the, the tile I didn't talk about this in my talk, but the there were embedded tiles in the aluminum um, countertops. Uh, we did do some cleaning on those just to make them look a little bit more in line with the clean cleanliness okay. of the aluminum. But aluminum in its own right did does hold up pretty well unless unless you abuse it, you know. So I, I but we didn't do much. I will admit we didn't do a lot. Okay, thank you very much. Uh... For the time being, there are all the questions I can see. Should there be any yeah. more, we'll email them to you. Thank you. Thank, sure. thank you very much, Roger. Um, now we have a, <laughs> it's really great that you could be with us. Thank you. Um, now we have a few questions for Astrid. Um, Astrid, could you unmute your microphone, please? Yes. And I have, to, um, I have to admit that the first question is from me, but it also relates a little bit to a question asked later by Henning. So the question I asked was, did you assess the expected lifetime of the epoxy, um, which ties into the question asked by Henning a couple of questions down, which is around retreatability um, and how you, uh, how you um, deal kind of um, philosophically and practically with the idea with um, uh, epoxies being chemically cured against the conservation drive for retreatability okay so i think um, the unmixed epoxy raisin has a lifetime about one to two years if you store it in the right place and i think epoxy raisin itself are known for their long-term st resistance or stability um, but, well, actually, it was a master thesis, so I haven't investigated uh, that topic. Um, the point of the ethic, I think, um, and deteriorated or uh, degraded object should be consolidated if there's really no other way. And I think at that point, it doesn't make a difference if you're actually applying an epoxy or in polyacrylate, I think if you remove it, it will cause a lot of damage. So I think if you're using consolidation as I know the, the, the last thing, I think then it's okay to use epoxy raisins just to yeah, kind of keep it alive. Um that's a really interesting um, answer, and there may be some more responses in the chat because, of course, uh, that does come back to you'll know from a uh, presentation that I've done reversibility is a challenging idea to challenge in conservation. So uh, it really comes down to a very deeply held set of values that we have. Um, Sophie asked, did the sponsorship of the epoxy company influence the epoxies tested? Pardon me? Uh, sorry, I didn't. So know. your research was sponsored by an epoxy company. Did uh, that well, sponsorship uh, affect well, the uh, choice of epoxies? Uh, <laughs> well, of course, because uh, yeah, they, uh, I didn't get any money. I just got uh, some materials of them, and of course, I just could use uh, yeah. their types of products. And but well, it was the best way for the master thesis. So, well, of course, it affected my yeah. <laughs> my choice, of course. <laughs> yeah. But I suspect that, I mean, I think there's probably quite a lot more research to be done, but in some ways, um, the principles of, of consolidating with epoxy are encapsulated in the project. Um, so if you also asked, how did, did you, how did you prepare the degraded wood or did you just have some already worm-eaten wood at hand? Uh, no, I actually, um, I, um, uh, well, uh, I, it, it took me quite long to find some degraded or proper degraded wood and uh, yeah. then I just uh, used the normal uh, carpentry stuff uh, to, <laughs> to yeah. uh, make my um, specimens, so okay. sanding, sawing, etc. Mm -hmm. That's 
but not Actually, by hand, of course. <laughs> yeah. That's that's really interesting. So I've got a question again. It's one of mine, which is as you as I was listening, you said uh, once we'd applied the epoxy, I, I wiped the excess from the surface, and I wondered what you'd wipe the excess away with. Well. Uh, I just used a normal laboratory tissue because uh, okay, insulation so it's just surface dry wasn't work. wasn't my uh, my topic. Yeah. But uh, well, yeah. uncured epoxy raisins can be removed by acetone. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sebastian has asked, why not use D5 in, instead of cyclododecane? Oh. Well, actually, I don't know what uh, D5 is, but okay. well, insulation wasn't uh, part of the, <laughs> okay. of the scene. Uh, so D5 is a silicon solvent, so it's very, very non-polar. Um, so, okay. but if it's not something that you're aware of, that explains why it wasn't part of your methodology. Um, oh. <coughs> Henning asked, <coughs> in, in your comments, you said um, we should only apply the amount, the the minimum amount of consolidant that we need to, and Henning has asked, uh, sort of, um, the the bringing you bringing it back to earth. Well, how do you work that out? How do you work out the required amount of consolidant? Well, that's a pretty pretty good question, and I think um, that will need uh, a lot of more yeah, a lot more studies, theses, etc. Because I think we haven't figured it out okay. until now, and I okay. haven't either. <laughs> That's um, really honest and very much appreciated for that. There's no, I, it's always really positive when somebody says, do you know, I think we just need to do more work on that one. Um, and there's one more question from Omkil Tom, uh, which is, says he's a master's student at the University of Antwerp uh, and he's researching a similar topic. And he has two questions. Did you test multiple samples? Actually, he's got three questions. Did you test multiple samples? How long was the drying time before you rang the tests? And were the samples done by absorption method only? Yes, I had multiple samples and uh, the drying or curing time was over seven weeks. And yes, I only used the absorption method. I hope that answered it. I hope so too. If it hasn't answered it, Uncle Tom, um, pop another question into the chat and we will make sure that uh, we pass it on to, uh, to Astrid. So thank you, Astrid. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank well you for done. me as well. And um, now we have a few questions for Valmut. Could you unmute your microphone, please? Yes, thank you. Um, Valmut, uh, yeah, that's the uh, first question from Shane. Uh, do you know what plasticizers were incorporated into this cellophane? <laughs> Um, I believe um, we we did not test that on my object, but um, uh, glycerin was you was mentioned as a possible um, plasticizer. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, uh, I have a question myself, and I was wondering you you said you. Uh, you didn't uh, think it was possible to kind of restore the original functionality of the of the object. Do you, do you th or in this case at least, um, do you think uh, it would be possible at all to restore the seat to be set on? And um, are there any methods that you considered when you came to your um, uh, conclusion that it wasn't possible? Um, well, to be honest, at first I was advised against trying to make it um, structurally sound again uh, because of the scope of my project. Later, um, I realized that if you try to, if you, if you would be able to structure, uh, structurally make sound one broken uh, strand, then the strand right next to it, which was also very abraded, would also break. Um, so I, I have thought about it, but I couldn't really imagine a method where you could um, uh, undo all the um, abrasion. And to my knowledge, there's also not a satisfactory method to um, structurally make sound uh, natural rush seats. So um, I think for that, it's kind of the same problem. Uh, but yeah, it would be very interesting. I was kind of 
um, disappointed that I could not make it, make it structurally sound. Yeah, it is difficult. I, I can imagine that. I, I was, um, yeah, it's it's something that uh, uh, should be researched in the future. I think it's a um, uh, very uh, interesting topic. Yeah. Topic. Thank you very much, Almut. Um, there are all the questions uh, we have for you. So, Thank you. Uh, uh, so if that's all the questions, then I'd like yep. to thank Roger and Astrid and Van Moot very, very much. Um, thank you to all the people in the audience for the interesting questions. Um, and we will collect any remaining questions and forward them to their speakers so they can have a look at them later. We're going to take a short break of 10 minutes now. So you should uh, grab a cup of tea or a beer and some cookies or chips. Um, for your With your tea, you might want a quick, uh, to, to enjoy the, a uh, tribute song to the Frankfurt Kitchen by Rotifer. Uh, the YouTube link is in the chat. I've just posted it. And I hope that this will be the institution for a tribute song uh, to some treatment for the next Connex conference. That would be a, a great addition to our, to our platform. So we'll see you back in 10 minutes.
Hi. Hi. It's me, Henning. Hi, Henning. Hi, Henning. I'm shutting up right away. So now our break is over, our 10 minutes are over. Um, uh, so welcome back everyone. I hope you had a lovely little break. We are running a little bit behind in our schedule, but I hope you'll bear with us and stay a bit longer to enjoy the following two talks. And uh, first off is uh, Jana Simone Mostert. And uh, Jana just completed her master's degree here in Potsdam at the University of Applied Sciences. And today she will present the results of her master's thesis. Um, Jenna researched and explored conservation and restoration techniques for plywood or laminated wooden objects and focused on um, uh, different possibilities of re-adhering. Um, and uh, yeah, Jenna, the stage is yours. Hi, Jana, we can't hear you. Hi. Ah, now we can hear you. Hello. Everything's good. Yeah. Sorry. Um, no problem. Just looking for my presentation. Sorry. It's loading. <laughs> now we can see it, actually. And um, if it helps, I can forward the slides whenever you tell me to. I, um, to be honest, I would be, um, or just try to share again. Jana, can we help you in any way? Thank you. So we can all continue drinking that beer or tea and eating our cookies. Jana? Jana, Jana, your microphone is muted. Hmm. 
now is not. No, your microphone, we can hear you. There was just a message saying that you were loading the whiteboard rather than your presentation. That's what we've just seen. Okay, but you can see my presentation now. No, we can't. Because I can't see it either. I have no... Okay. Uh, now we've got a presentation coming up. Mm -hmm. Can you see it, Jana? Jana? Mm -mm. No. I only see uh, the speakers now. Okay. Okay. Um, perhaps you just uh, talk and I forward the slides. Okay. Sorry about that, but... Uh... Yeah, okay. Yeah, is that sorry, okay? Sorry, but... Uh, yeah, that's coming. There it is. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, well done. Uh, sorry no for, for the delay. Um, and uh, welcome to my presentation of my master thesis, Exploring Conservation and Restoration Techniques for Applied Laminated Wooden Objects, with the main focus on possibilities of readhering. As you can see here, the difference between plain laminations are the direction of the stacked layers. Plywood, the veneers are cross-layered, whereas uh, with laminated build-ups, the veneer the grains of the veneer are placed in one direction. Ply and laminated wood are made from several layers, might be from different wood species combined with an adhesive. The objects made of these materials come in a wide variety of shapes. Although these materials are strong and resilient. The material tends to delaminate, split uh, after a time. Um, because of the nature of the material buildup, damages occurring in these types of objects can be very challenging to overcome. Also, the material composition makes it difficult to analyze. Therefore, the main questions for this research were how to uh, restore damages and material loss seen in these objects made with ply or laminated wood without losing the full function of the object. Does the chosen material um, meant to stabilize or overcome these damages affect the original substance of the object. And the last are the, some damages only mendable using irreversible adhesives or other invasive techniques. To tackle these research questions, a multifaceted approach was chosen. Um, this to analyze the damages found in ply and laminated objects. Therefore, I examined a range of objects, visually recorded the damages, and tried to find out what, have what could have caused them. In a second step, I tried to recreate certain damages using dummy material, but that's for later. And some common uh, damage ph phenomena of ply of ply and <laughs> laminated buildups are, for instance, blisters, delamination, surface checks, tearing and cracking of the veneers. material losses and the most complex one fracturing or splitting through the multiple layers with possible delamination. So 
some of these damages I just showed you are pre-programmed due to production failures such as lathe checks due to false positioning of the nose bar or wrong seasoning and drying of the veneers which can lead to the surface checks that I showed you earlier, irregular moisture content within the veneers false distancing, dur distancing during joining of the veneers and starved joints or the opposite of the glue lines can lead to further damaging of uh, the object over time. Aging and deterioration processes of the materials play a great role. For instance, the laminations of the layers often occurs due to the deterioration of the adhesive. The deterioration of the adhesive can be caused by parasitic and microbial deterioration or influenced by moisture and or water, especially combined with elevated temperatures. And mechanical strain on the objects or dimensional changes of the veneers. Aging and decline of the quality within the veneers can be caused and accelerated by a low pH of the adhesive, as well as the natural defects as knots and compression wood, for example. They can cause irregular tension, which in turn can also lead to delamination and splitting of the veneers. Most of these objects have been designed for usage. Repeated motions can cause strain, sudden impacts of heavy objects can cause breakage. Alternative usage of the objects, such as using a chair as a step, may lead to devastating damages of the objects. Most of these damages I've shown you here require in the end uh, re-adhering or enforce, reinforcement. However, sometimes newly added materials used to repair these types of damages or used to stabilize the original substance may have unexpected negative, negative influences on the origi original materials. To test uh, which material provides the best outcome Dummy material was used. Several analytic methods were utilized to provide a better understanding of the changes within the composition of the plywood buildups used for uh, this project. To determine the adhesives, we ran into some di difficulties. The glue lines of the materials are extremely thin, making it difficult for microscopic observations of the cross sections. And therefore, the results were inconclusive. Microchemical analysis was also inconclusive because of the similarities within the chemical composition used to produce the adhesives. and IR spectroscopy is only possible with a reference database, which at the time we did not we did not have ac any access to. Um, also. The wood species used to produce the veneers are also um, an important factor when it comes down to choosing the right adhesives for re-adhering, as I will demonstrate later on in the presentation. Some woods can be identified microscopically because of their di distinctive appearance. If not, microscopic identification can provide a better outcome. 
a difference in hardness within one surface due to the cross layering of the veneers and adhesive layers make sampling by hand often impossible. Therefore, I developed a hand microtome which can be mounted directly onto the object. Settings like orientation in height and left and right can be adjusted with precision. The main intention of the project was to search for the best material and methods used for restoring damages in ply and laminated wooden objects and to find out if those materials could have had a negative impact on the original material compositions. Most damages that we have observed, um, they required real adhering. Choosing the right adhesive therefore is vital. Setting, especially setting or the drying process of the adhesives, which can have a very negative effect on the veneers. We also must consider which effect of the pH of the adhesives can have on the wood species that's been used for the buildup, the viscosity of the adhesives, the water content within the adhesives, the gap filling properties as well as bond strength, etc. Um, here are some examples of less compatible adhesives and their negative outcome. Uh, for instance, uh, here in this image you um, see a casein which has a high pH and they can cause irreversible staining within the veneers. A low viscosity of a adhesives may lead to uh, starved joints and too much penetration of the veneers. And this has, can have irreversible damaging to a object. Free water content of the adhesive may lead to too much swelling and shrinkage of the veneers, causing the deformation and splitting. A weak bond strength can may cause premature failure of the glue line, as you can see here. In conservation, we uh, set high expectations of a adhesives, but none of the adhesives on the market actually meets all the requirements we aim for. Uh, for the research, I chose uh, seven adhesives. They meet a selection of the requirements, such as the ones listed here. A range of tests with these adhesives were, was conducted. Not to harm any objects by experimenting on them, plywood materials for testing was found on a bulky waste plant or were given to me by a colleague. Out of these materials, samples were prepared. For every adhesive, one board of 15 by 15 centimeters was cut. To reenact the lamination of the layers, um, one half of the board was delaminated, then re-adhered using the appointed uh, adhesives. They were then photographed and stored in the calamity cabinet. After the last cycle was finished, the samples were again photographed and compared with their before state. The second group of samples were prepared for finding the best adhesive used for splits and broken plywood. Again, for every adhesive, one board was prepared 
and now the tensor strength of the adhesive was tested. Evaluating the impact of the different adhesives on the re-adhered pieces, it became apparent that certain properties of the adhesives can have negative effects on the plywood, especially adhesives with physical drying properties. They may cause unwanted tension within the buildup, as I illustrate here. There are more factors of why an adhesive might have a negative effect or not. This traffic light system is created to show you which adhesives were particularly well compatible and which adhesive had the least desirable effect. Wood species and thickness of the veneer play an important role. As you can see here, the best result was achieved with epoxy. whereas paraloid doesn't really do the trick at all. A similar result to the outcome of the laminated pieces was seen during the tensor strength testing of the adhesive. In correspondence with the manufacturer Movital of PVB, they uh, explained that mixing PVB with epoxy would make the epoxy more flexible. I experimented with the mixture a bit and um, for and used it also for the tensor strength, uh, tensor strength testing. I mixed the PVB and the epoxy one without any alternations and Another set I applied heat after I joined the pieces. The last uh, set appeared to be extremely strong. A good preparation is very important. In addition to the crest test dummies, the adhesives were also used in, for practical applications. Because plywood objects are often oddly shaped with curves and bends in multiple directions, to ensure that the resetting of the broken piece will be successful, the use of specially designed jigs or moldings, and in some cases, flexible bends are required to guide and push the different elements into the right position, as I illustrate here. The production of plywood has had an enormous impact on the production of furniture. Although the materials are very resistant, they have their own limits. The damages seen on ply or laminated wooden ob objects can be quite difficult to overcome. Choosing the right adhesives to reset broken elements is challenging, especially for a piece that is needed to be functional again and not being placed in a museum environment. Using the appropriate method and material can prolong the existence of an object. During the research, it became clear that certain adhesives commonly chosen for conservation purposes, such as fish glue or paraloid, may have negative effects on plywood structures. And the adhesives that we might be more cautious of because of their of because they can't be readjusted after setting showed the more showed the most stable and re strong results of course there are more adhesives available available on the market and certain modifications could could improve the the adhesives but these could not be tested during this research. One question could not 
fully be answered during the process. That is, if the newly applied adhesives would have an influence on the old adhesives. This was because we were unable to identify the adhesives of the plywood used for testing. Summing up, I must conclude that for some defects, the application of irreversible methods or materials may be inevitable, especially if the object is to be used. <laughs> More research in this field is required for the future. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Janet. Plywood conservation can be really challenging, so this is a really useful contribution for everybody. If the audience has any questions, could you please add them to the chat? Our next uh, speaker is Anne Jacquemin, who is currently a master's student at the University of Antwerp, specialising in wood conservation. Her presentation today is an update on current research into decorative laminates, for example, for mica or the GMA. And the stage is yours. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Can you all hear me? Well, I yep, presume. We okay, perfect. <laughs> yep. So, hi, everyone. Thank you for the introduction and possibility to present my ongoing research here tonight. Um, Today I want to talk to you about decorative laminates in context of conservation and restoration. And to start with, I believe that we should care about historical decorative laminates and that currently they are an overlooked material. I will introduce you to some definitions and the history and production method. And next, the state of the arts emphasizes the importance of this research and leads us to with what research methods decorative laminates can best be investigated with. Based on other collections, I created my own sample collection and used macro and microscopic research in an attempt to gain meaningful knowledge and understanding. I will talk about sampling methods, my experience with sample preparations, and finally, the microscopic views themselves. Now, during my internship at the Design Museum of Ghent, it became clear that there was great diversity in conservation treatments for decorative laminates. A specific project of typical Memphis-style sofa from Nathalie Dupasquier was actual reason for this research. However, in carrying out a treatment, it is important to understand your material with its history and production. Now, although I would have loved to have treated the sofa, the question of what are decorative laminates actually seemed of greater importance. It soon became clear that there are many different names given to decorative laminates. Aminoplastic laminates, phenolic bound paper, formica, or just laminates. And this is where the diversity first became apparent. So the search for definition con um, continued. In patents, for example. In the patents database, we came across 62,469 results for the term decorative laminates alone. Now, an early found patent was one from Leo Bakeland in 1912, which doesn't even mention decorative laminates, but it does refer to a composite cardboard consisting of superposed layer of paper or the like combined with intermediate layers of an insoluble, infusible condensation product of phenols and formaldehyde. Now, in the ISO standard on decorative laminates in 1981, first of all, they mentioned the term decorative laminate. And secondly, they specify the pressure that should not be less than five megapascal. And then the last ISO standard in 2018, they already make the differentiation in the term high pressure decorative laminates and other production methods. And just for the illustration, here is even more variation. Um, on the left, you have a fully colored core, a decorative layer of wood veneer, a decorative laminate for flooring, and one with a metal top layer. Now, the production process starts with stage A, 
the impregnation of the sheet material. Um, I will take, I will try to take my pointer to show you if I can find it. Yes, I think you should see it now. Um, just a second. So, um, in stage A, the impregnation of the sheet material. It is moved via tension rollers in bats of resin. The subsequent rollers, which you can also see here, remove the superfluous resin, and then it passes through ovens to dry. It is cut into sheets and is ready to go to the press. Now in stage B, which is on the next slide, the various sheets produced in stage A are pressed under high pressure and heat into one homogeneous sheet. Now this schematic view shows what the structure of a decorative laminate is. The core often consists of several layers of craft paper soaked in phenolic resin. The decor or overlay are soaked in aminoplastic resins, mainly melamine resin. Many people think of decorative laminate as if it was originated in the 1950s, but, the, but a longer evolution preceded it. Firstly, they were used for mechanical and technical reasons in the industry, but next to that, they provided an answer to the shortage of natural materials as decorative imitation material. Developments followed quickly in color variation, but at the same time, the material itself was improved. For example, melamine resin in 1938 displayed an important role in the development of the current diversity in decorative laminates because of its very high durability and transparency. Now, in the post-war period, interior applications exploded, but it was not until the 1980s that the first floor applications were made. So what do we find today? Until today, the information is often contemporary, highly technical, very fragmented, and often found in engineering journals. For the conservator, there is only little information available on historic decorative laminates, and only a few have published on the conservation of this material. Nevertheless, degraded objects are found and treatment methods have not yet been fully investigated. So in my research, in order to lay a foundation, it is important to question which research methods can be apprehended to study the materials and techniques of historical decorative laminates with the objective of achieving a better understanding. So the first method is actually archival research and it's and based on ma magazines and articles, we can see what was important at the time what names were given to the products, which latest industrial processes were current, and which properties were strived for. Um, properties like strength, hygiene and comfort, resistance against all kinds of external conditions, including heat and cigarettes, for example. In decorative laminates, these properties are very useful, such as in walls, surfaces, signs, tables and bars. The amount of application is still increasing. This advertisement, for example, shows how decorative laminates simplify housework, are durable, and are heat resistant. Now, by looking more and more at different laminates, including looking in archives at, at old sales catalogs and sample books, the more it became clear that they were becoming more diverse over time. In the 1930s, the colors were still dark and brownish due to their production. But with the advent of amino resins, the development of different colors, shapes, but also surface finishes began. Occasionally, a clean design arose, and in the 1980s, this exploded. Shape and color became the main focus of the material, and it was almost elevated to an art form. Today, the possibilities are endless. It is even possible to print your own pictures for the decor layer. So now we know the background history, production method, and which materials were used. 
I'd like to present you how I try to get a better understanding on the material with material research. Accessible and less accessible methods were tried, like a sliding out for thickness, optical and later also digital microscopes. And finally, SAM-ADX was also executed on a few samples. It was decided to compose a sample collection on which research could be carried out. It was important to be able to date these samples and, if possible, to place them in their context. I felt grateful to be able to work with the sample collection of the University of Cologne, some objects of the Design Museum Kent, and also on sample books found in the archives of the Biennale Interieur of Kortrijk. All these samples result in this overview. Now, on the right side, the thickness of the samples make us wonder whether there might be a trend here. And if we rank them by thickness, apparent is that many decorative laminates from earlier years are actually thicker than the more recent ones. And today, nice to know, is that the commonly used thickness for interior application is 0.8 millimeters, with exceptions up to 1.2 millimeters while the old ones are often 1.4 millimeters. Now, before any kind of research can be done, the method of sampling needed to be explored. Several tests have been conducted, from a chisel, a bone marrow needle, until a fine automatic multi-tool with circular saw blade. Now, there is difference between taking samples from loose pieces of decorative laminate or from a decorative laminate already fixed on an object. In sample preparations, also several methods were tested. Dry planing with a microtome and wet polishing were tested and proved to be adequate methods. But they have to be used for the right research methods because with wet polishing, we can achieve a very smooth surface, but the risk of contamination of different resins is high. The microtome then gives minimal contamination, but the result is not as smooth. Then optical and digital microscopy was used to get a detailed view of the layered buildup. And then SEM-ADX was used to obtain a detailed view of surface structure and detection of inorganic elements. Within this research, it is decided to study the material in cross-section because of the interest in the layeredness. And initially, it was questioned whether the layers of craft papers could still be visible in the core. In the results of the sample examination so far, this was impossible, except for one. This was, um, this was this sample. Now you can see the scratches on the, from planing with the microtome. I'll try to show you, let me see. Mm -hmm. So the scratches from the microtome on the embedding resin are here. And the horizontal lines from um, presumably um, craft papers are here. So that's also to be seen on the next slide. The schematic view next to it shows where we are. So craft paper is here, and this is also the core layer we are looking at at the moment. So perhaps this can be linked to incomplete impregnation during the production process, as I mentioned before. Now another sample shows an aluminum sheet underneath a decorative layer. This metal foil is related to what Formica once patented in 1931 to obtain a cigarette-proof decorative laminate. Now we could use this information to determine the application of this specific decorative laminate. In this case, it can be stated that it would be used in interior applications such as tables and countertops, but most likely not for wall claddings. So this ADX mapping, which by the way, I was very grateful for to be able to use thanks to the University of Cologne. The SEM ADX mapping revealed several inorganic elements. And first of all, the, alum the aluminum foil is clearly distinguishable. It is here, it is. Um, but also sulfur was detected in the white underlying paper. The nitrogen seen on both the bottom and on the top of the sample 
it could be related to melamine formaldehyde instead of phenol formaldehyde. And besides looking at the chemical composition, SEM also provides the opportunity to take a close look at the surface of the material. And in some samples, micro cracks were found. And in this one, a separation of layers was observed above and below the white sheet of paper. Oh. So if I make a small recap, the tests with sample preparations led to a number of adequate methods that can be applied depending on research uh, methodology. Next to this, the different research methods help us to understand the material. A detailed look at what the material actually is. We could make a clear distinction between core, decorative and overlay and the evolution in time, function and thickness were interesting observations. Now, to conclude, we cannot deny that decorative laminates are highly diverse material, that this has increased over time and is still increasing today. This is shown by the amount of patents, differences in ISO standards, sample books and advertisements. However, it is possible to make a distinction and possibly even contextualize it. Design decorative patterns and colors are sometimes time bound and can provide additional information. So let's not overlook this material in this fast and underexplored field of materials. As this is an ongoing research, I would like to apply um, next. Um, I hope to apply FTIR imaging and hope to be able to continue the comparative research between the samples from the collection. It will be interesting to contextualize a sample from the Memphis style sofa, for example. And then also, given the fact that the research to decorative laminates is only taking off, there is still big potential for additional research. In short, further more delineated studies can provide more insights into the material, like case studies, degradational aspects, surface studies, and so on. So I hope this presentation has helped to introduce you to the rich and diverse worlds that decorative laminates are, because it might provide us with necessary background information and material technical information could be used in function of treatments. So if there are any questions, I will be happy to answer them. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your very interesting talk, um, Anne. Um, it's a fascinating material that in a way brought us full circle back to the kitchens um that we had at the start so um we now have a short uh, question and answer session and um again there are some questions in the uh, chat box and um i have a question from the audience for jana could you turn on your microphone please hello jana Yes, hello. 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 Um, now, Shane is asking uh, now after your research, if you had to choose an adhesive for delaminating plywood, which one would you choose? Perhaps you can clarify that once more. Well, I would actually um, use uh, and try and use epoxy, which might sound weird because of the um, because of the they can't be removed afterwards. But if you use them correctly and appropriately, they they are um, it is very a very stable method, and uh, further damaging can be um can be ha can be um, um, um protected although um if if you have if there is another option um i would also uh, consider a different adhesive okay Okay, um, thank you, 
Thank you very much. Um, yeah, you also mentioned um, the combination of epoxy and um, was it PV? Polyphony butyrol, yes. PVB, exactly. <laughs> That's the best one, yeah. Um, I can't see any more questions for you in the chat. Um, so thank you very much, Jana. Um, there is a question for for Anne now. Uh, so I just uh, wanted to make a comment, which I made in the chat, which is um, is an observation around laminates, which is that I once had to treat a table that had an imitation formica surface. So. Uh, while formica is sometimes used to imitate other things, things once formica became established, um, people are always try also trying to imitate formica. So uh, it made me laugh that, uh, of course, in, in uh, furniture and, and decorative surfaces, everything imitates everything else. Um, and then the other question that we have is a question which asks, do you know how laminates were used in industrial applications before the mass commercialization in the 1950s? Um, yes, uh, thank you for um, the interesting observation of the imitation from the imitation material. Um, so how it was used in um, industrial uh, sites, it was uh, used as a mechanical product um, because of its strength, um, but it was also um, used as cladding material in airplanes, for example, during the war. Um, but then there was no decorative layer on top most of the time, unless yeah, in, in cladding of the aeroplanes there was a decorative layer on top. But if it was only used for uh, mechanical reasons, it was not. Um, another important um, application in the industry was for electrical insulators. It became very um, widely used in um, radios, for example, um, because of the excellent electrical insulation property. I hope that was an answer to your question. It certainly was. That's very comprehensive. Thank you. Um, it is the last question of the evening, though. There's been no more asked. So that brings us to the end of the slightly overrunning second Connex session. Um, I'd like to thank uh, our keynote speaker again, Roger Griffith, um, and also give a big thank you to all the speakers from today, Astrid Belling, Valmut Kleb, Jana Mostert and Anne Jacquemin. And we'd also like to thank our institutes and partners, and not least you, the audience, for make, making this event happen and for participating and really listening um, to those presentations. Yeah, and the next session is in uh, two weeks' time on the 25th of April. And um, because next week um, is um, uh, Easter Monday. And uh, it deals with some very rare and precious objects and materials will be quite interesting. Our keynote speaker is uh, Emma Hermans. And uh, the session will be presented by Julia Schulz and Henning Schulze. So see you all in two weeks and uh, yeah, the same time, same place. Bye. Bye.